taking a back seat, man, because we're going to have to have something in these coming days that we can hold on to. we got to have something that's real and that's life-giving, man. And, and, and I was studying, I felt this week to, to look at the word compel. And I started to study that word compel and what it really means and, and how in Mark, I think it's chapter 18 in, in Luke, um, as well, it talks about compelling them. Jesus said, compelling to come into the house. Compel them to come into the things of God. If you look up that word compel, it literally meant force them into, right? Get them by all means necessary into where they need to get. It's kind of like the paramedic when you have somebody that gets hurt really bad and they're a first responder and, and I had to take a bunch of first responders classes just in case I got somewhere and I didn't know how to do CPR and all this different stuff and they showed us a trick and, and touching a spot that they said was really hurting without them knowing it, man, like reaching down and they just seeing it. They're like, ah, oh, and start screaming. You know they're not lying. If they don't, then you know they're just full of full of garbage man you know what I'm saying and they're not really real and and I feel like the Lord's kind of doing something like that with us man I believe he, he's he's reaching down and touching areas in our life man and and we're jumping and saying oh man that's not right God and then I begin to look at this word compel and get him into the house of God like that first responder would get him in to that ambulance and get him to the hospital no matter what they could be screaming crying you can't move me I remember when I got in the car wreck and I was looking at the tread of my shoe. My leg was broken completely in half. And I was looking at the bottom of my foot. I remember in this car wreck. And, and the paramedics were there. And they got their jaws of life. And they cut my car out. And I'm, I'm like, you got to knock me out. And they're like, we can't knock you out. We can't give you anything. They put this rubber thing in my mouth, Rob. And said, bite down and yell if you have to. And when they started to pull me out of that car, man, I realized every broken bone and my hip was dust. My knee was broken. Both my shins, my ankle, and my shoulder were all crushed in this wreck. And they like flying me to a hospital. They didn't care what I said because they saw the need and they saw the brokenness and they said, we have to get you somewhere where you can get help. I started to study that word and I actually had a whole sermon written out on it. And the more I studied it, the more it took me a little bit of a different direction still about compelling and a man that was compelled to do something. A man that wasn't the, the, the one that you would pick to do something about ruin. A man that, that, that was just an ordinary guy going through his normal life. And one day, he just decided to have a conversation with his friend. And he said, you know, how's my people doing, man? And this is where I'm from. How's everything going? And they gave him a report that absolutely destroyed him. And this man's name was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was an ordinary man, and, but, but, but he had a broken heart for the issues of his people. I want you to hear this, man. There's not many people that have a broken heart for anything but themselves. You don't find it often out there, man. And Nehemiah, who had a broken heart for the issues of his people, you're going to see Nehemiah was the last man that probably wanted to go do something about the ruin. Because he had it made, man. He was the king's second. He was right there. He got to eat with the king ate and watch what the king watched and do what the king did, man. He had the best of everything. But he sat back, this ordinary guy that's heart began to broke and he began to look at the situation of his people and he said, I can't sit by and do nothing. I, I just simply can't. Somebody has to do something. And he said, it might as well be me. So I want to take you to Nehemiah, man, and in and, 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 and verse 18 of chapter 2, we're going to start, and I'm going to bounce back to chapter 1 and back and forth. If you don't have a Bible, there's some back in the sound booth if you need one, man, if you need to, to take one home with you, there's some back there, man. So in the book of Nehemiah, Scripture says in verse 18, chapter 2, they began the good work. That's really all I want to read to you, man, right there. Somebody say the good work. He says they began... The good work. So let's pray real quick. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would stir us to believe that we can do exceedingly abundantly. God, more. But, your, but by your power to make a difference in the lives of people, God. God, give us the courage and the faith to step out. Would you speak to hearts, God? Would you speak to the hearts, God, in this room, Lord? Speak to every heart, God. Stir us to use the gifts whom, whom, whom you love, God. Use the people who you love and stir us to use our giftings to make a difference in the lives of other people and to glorify your name, God, in all we do. God, in absolutely everything we do, and we pray this in Jesus' name, the one who gave us perfect son, Jesus. 
God, we praise you for that. We thank you. We give you glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to get real quick into this. And, and I want you to hear what he said. Let the good work begin. And I, I'm not a good title guy, but Megan always asked me for a title to the sermon. But if I would put a title on this, I would title it, When You Can't Take It Anymore. When you literally can't take it anymore. When, when, you've, when you've exhausted everything in you and you can't take it anymore. What do you do? What do you do, man, when you're at that position where you just can't, you can't take the, the kids being abused anymore and you get tore up by it and it drives you insane. When you can't take it anymore, what do you do? Most people sit back and just talk about it. A lot of people sit back. What do you do when you're in a department at work and, and you just can't handle it and you can't take it and it's driving you nuts? What do you do? What do you do as a minister when, when you go and you get to preach at these men's rallies and go to all these places and speak the gospel and, and many people just look at you, hundreds of people everywhere you go and they don't get why you're so excited for Jesus and they don't get it why your heart breaks, why you get emotional in church, why I weep and cry. When I get into the presence of God and pray about unsafe, unsafe people, I immediately break down and weep every time whether I'm around just our staff or just me or in front of everybody, man. So what do you do when you can't take it anymore, man? We're going to look today at, at what is to me one of the most motivating, one of the most captivating, one of the most inspirational stories about an ordinary guy from the Old Testament that made an extraordinary difference. Right? Man, look around this room. There's nobody that's extraordinary. We're all ordinary people. We all put our pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. And if you're like me, when you take your shorts off, you kick them up in the air and catch them. You ever do that, man? And then, then I feel like, then I feel like Macho Man when you walk in the back and you're like, yeah, did anybody see that? Anybody else take their socks off without bending over? It's just me. And I kick, I kick them off like slippers, and both of them kick off right there next to my bed, where I can just slide right back in them the next morning if I need to, man. I'm, some little tricks that we have, man, and, and just an ordinary man didn't ordinary things. Nehemiah wasn't, he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't a priest, he, he wasn't a king, and he wasn't a prophet, right? He was none of those things. He wasn't anybody in the Bible that had signed up for ministry and said, hey, I want to go do what he's doing. I want to stand up front and preach. He wasn't that guy, man. Nehemiah wasn't a warrior. You look at the Bible and my prayers as a man has been, God, make me a warrior. I thought I was the man before Christ and I thought I didn't have a, a person that I could face that could beat me, man. And, and I just thought I was invincible. But, but now I get saved and, 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 man, I realize I wasn't anything but an ordinary person. But I wanted to be this warrior. I wanted to be this spider. I wanted to have this reputation. And then I come to Christ, and, and what happens when I came to Christ? I would get timid and not sit in a corner like this, and people would be singing, and I'd be like, what's wrong with them? Why are they singing so loud? Not realizing six months earlier, I was in the bar singing, Hank Jr., tearing my beard, crying over something that who knows what it was, man. Emotional was all get out, but I get into the house of God, and, and that boldness to be a warrior and to be a, a mighty man for God went out the window at times, man. But Nehemiah was just this ordinary person that heard about something that broke his heart. Listen to me, man. That heard about something that broke his heart, that crushed his spirit to a point where he had to do something about it. Right? He was compelled to make a difference in the world around him. And I want to ask you this question today. Is that where you're at? Are you compelled to make a difference in the world around you? Do you feel called to that? Do you feel forced into that, you feel compelled. Some of the definitions that I looked up of the word compel involve pictures with hands being tied up by ropes. I was like, whoa, man, this is getting serious. <laughs> Literally, it was saying, bind them, get them to the place where they need to go, man. Compel them. And, and Nehemiah felt compelled to do something to make a difference in the world around him. But he was an ordinary guy. So what does he do? He's an ordinary guy in a little town that didn't have anything big going on. What, what did he do, man? If you don't know much about Nehemiah, Nehemiah was, was known as a cupbearer, right? That was his title. That was his job. He was a cupbearer. And Nehemiah was a cupbearer of the king of Persia, King Artaxes. And now you may say, what in the world is a cupbearer? And that's a good question. But, but listen, if you would compare it to today, it'd be kind of like a servant or maybe a butler. Um, could be the equivalent of a cupbearer, man. But a cupbearer was incredibly trusted. 
Hear me, man. He was incredibly trusted because if you could imagine, this guy had access to the king at all times. Right? At all times. So if the king's having a private conversation and he says, hey, I think we need to go attack so-and-so at this place, the cupbearer would hear him. And he would have to be very trustworthy and he would have to be confidential and he would have to be a man that wouldn't take that word out anywhere outside of the king's chambers, man. Right? So if the king said, I don't like the way so-and-so walks, that cupbearer had to keep that private, man. The cupbearer was going to hear it and he was going to have to keep that information to himself. So this guy would have been incredibly trustworthy. Right? Ordinary man. But he would have been full of integrity and he was also incredibly loyal to the king because the cupbearer would do important things for the king. Right? When, 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 if you could imagine, there was a time in history when, when many people were trying to kill the king. Right? You ever see Ray Hard movies like that, man? That was, there was a lot of stuff going on like that, man. And they would try to take the king out because they wanted to take the territory and they wanted to take the kingdom and they would try to overthrow the king. And the cupbearer would do all these things to make sure the king was protected. He was the only guy that would taste the wine before the king would drink it. So I want you to think about this for a second, man. I don't know about you, but if I'm the guy tasting the wine, I want a good health insurance. I want good benefits, man. Because any time my job goes bad, I'm not only, I'm only probably out of a job, but I'm probably out of a life. Right? If this goes wrong, my life seeks to exist. So I'm going to have it. I'm going to be, my life's going to be comfortable. I'm going to have it made. King, if you want me to drink your wine to make sure it's not poison before you drink it, you're going to have to make sure I'm taken care of and I'm comfortable. So Nehemiah had no reason. He was comfortable. Many people in church are comfortable. They sit there week in and week out and they, they might live paycheck to paycheck, but that might be the biggest problem that a lot of them have, man. And they like the comfort of their own home and they like the comfort of things. And, and you don't want to make any changes because you're good. You're comfortable. You get comfortable in habits, whether they're good habits or bad habits. And we have such a hard time breaking out of them, man. Such a hard time that there was a statistic that only 9% of people Right, 9% of people in this study that had heart disease, but they could have just changed their diet and they would have been fine. No health issues, no medication, no surgery. Only 9% of those people made the changes in their habits that they needed to make. The rest of them had to have open heart surgery and a lot of them passed away because they weren't willing to make the change and get out of the comfort of what they felt like their home was. One guy said, no, I like eating, I like drinking big cups of milk and eating all this stuff. Well, man, you're going to die of a heart attack. And he said, I'd rather die of a heart attack than, than risk giving up that comfort. And this is where so many people that I, that I meet with are. They're, they're comfortable in their garbage. They're comfortable in their life. They're comfortable even though they wish it was different. They won't do anything to be different. And Nehemiah was in a position where he was comfortable, man, and, and he was an ordinary person, and he had a great role. He had a great status, man. He had the role of a servant, right? Can you get any greater than that, man? He was serving, but he was ordinary, serving the needs of the king. And one day, Nehemiah on an ordinary day, man, one day, right, this, this, this king came at him and he said, what's going on with you, Nehemiah? I can see something is wrong. I can see you acting and I see you're in a place that you've never been before. And I can see that something's bothering you. And here's how the story goes in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 2. It says, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. He's asking them about his friends and about his home. How's everybody doing? So we're having a conversation between Nehemiah and his brother, and he says, tell me about our people, man. Tell me about our homeland. Now, the reason Nehemiah is asking about this is because 140 years prior to this moment, 586 B.C. it was, man, and the Babylonians were under the rule of, of evil King Nebuchadnezzar, man, and y'all heard me preach about him before. And he attacked the Jewish people and completely demolished their city. Now, I want you to catch this for a second, man. Demolish their city past the point that any of us can comprehend, right? Like, we, we might have some broken down buildings, and we might have some space that needs filled, and things like this. But the Babylonians burned their city to the ground. I mean, you've heard of Solomon's temple, 
right? And Solomon built this temple that was beautiful and it housed the presence of God. There was nothing like it on the earth, man. It was spectacular. It was magnificent. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you. It was so, it was so beautiful and the Babylonians burned that thing to the ground. Every building, every one. Imagine going to East Liverpool and every building there is in rubble on the ground in just piles of brick in garbage. There's dead people in there. Your family members are in there. And it's been like that now for 140 years. Right? And it's horrible, man. And almost everyone that they knew was without a job. Almost everyone that he knew in his family and among the people of God that he knew were without a job. And they were without any kind of hope. And the Israelites, the Babylonians, I'm sorry, took the Jewish people captive. And he took them away from their homeland and they held them in bondage for a long time. So not only did you lose your buildings and your family members and, and your school and your church and everything, now you're held captive by these wicked people, man. And if you can imagine, the Jewish people felt demoralized, man. They felt completely hopeless and they said, what are we going to do? What in the world are we going to do? We have no homeland. Right? Life is over. And decades later, imagine this. Decades later, 50,000 Jews move back to Jerusalem to try to rebuild. Right? So you got 50,000 people that make a decision. We're going to leave out of this captivity. We're going to go home to where our home once was. And we're going to try to rebuild it, man. The city that we love. We're going to try to make a better future for ourselves. The problem was they couldn't get anything moving. They couldn't get anything rebuilt. They found themselves stalled in a complete dead end, right? They had no walls. They had no fortress. They had no anything. So every time they started, anybody in the world could come in, knock them out, knock everything they were trying to do down, and they would feel just totally hopeless, man. And it says this, man. That's when the brother said to Nehemiah in verse 3, those who survived the exile are back in the province and they are in great trouble and disgrace. Right? They're in great trouble and disgrace. Why? Because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, man, there's no protection from anything. There's no jobs. There's no leadership. There's no direction. There's no confidence. Sounds like tons of people that I know today in church and out of, her, out of church, they have no clue what to do with life other than what they've done for the past umpteen years, man. Right? And they get in the same cycle, doing the same things, in the same bondage, in the same pitfalls, man. And they never get out of it. They get in these ruts. And a rut to me, I call it an open-ended tomb. Because most people I know, they get in ruts, never get out of them, man. I know people that are offended 30 years later from something that happened all the way back. I know a lady in her 60s that's still offended over something that happened in high school. It's crazy to me, man. But it's real, and I've seen it happen, man. They get, they get stuck in it. So, man, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Nehemiah heard this, and he didn't know what to do. But he knew he had to do something, man. So what do you do when there's no hope whatsoever? There's almost a hundred, there's over a hundred thousand people dying every year right now from drugs. Over a hundred thousand a year from drugs. That's now twice as much as the Vietnam War combined. All together, more people in one year, over a hundred thousand people now. Just three years ago it was forty thousand. Now it's over 100,000. And I don't see the church blinking an eye. I don't see anyone anguished in the altars weeping over the people that are hurting. I don't see tears being shed across this place or anywhere I go saying, man, the, the, if this don't turn, we're not going to have a generation next that's coming after us. We're going to have death and destruction and ruin and no hope. So somebody has to do something. Somebody has to get stirred up to say, what do we do, man? What do you do when you don't know what to do when you see something that breaks your heart and you know there's a good work that needs to be done and you think perhaps you're supposed to be a part of that good work what do you do when you see something that bothers you so deeply that you can't take it anymore what do you do what do you do when you see children that, that are being abused two one in three girls are, are sexually abused by the time they're 13 years old one in three 
What do you do when you sit in the across from that little girl in my office and I have to talk to them and they explain things, man? What do you do when you sit there and hear that and you don't have anything in your heart but go kill the man that just did this, man? What do you do when, there's, when, when you don't know what to do and it seems like there's no hope, man? When you see something that bothers you and you can't take it anymore, I want to give you three thoughts about how to begin your good work. Because everyone in here gets anguished over something. Everyone in here gets, if you're a believer in Christ, you're going to get anguished over something, man. So what do you do, man? The first thing we see Nehemiah do, and you may end up doing at some point in your life, I have to pray, or all this me and you were talking about this before church. Number one is you actually sit down and you cry. Most men today would say, that's ridiculous. You'll never do that. You shouldn't sit and cry as a man. The Bible says that Nehemiah, when he heard the news, he sat down and he wept. And then he began to do other things. But the first thing that he did was he sat down and he wept, man. So you sit down and you let whatever it is, whatever injustice in the world that breaks your own heart, you sit down and you get anguished over it. The problem that we have in the church today is ain't nobody anguished over the sin of the people of the world that are going to hell. So we develop a people that are a social club more than we are an army stressed for battle. We become somebody that wants to get in the house of God and just deal with the, the people that are the good Christians and they dress just right and look just right. But what about all the ones that are out there that are poor and widows and children and they're dying and children are growing up in these broken homes? What do we do about it, man? I don't know about you, but I didn't ask for this burden. It just came upon me. When I gave my heart to Jesus, I started to see things in a different light. I started to see leaders who needed people to stand with them. No matter what, man, no matter what, to stand with them and to fight for them and to be by their side and to encourage them. God gave me that burden. I didn't want to do that, but I seen leaders that were treated like trash and it anguished me. I've seen schools, man, and I remember doing drugs when I was 11 years old in school. Like, I got weed from school. I didn't see it in my home. I never seen alcohol in my home, cigarettes in my home. I never seen weed in my home. I never seen drugs in my home. I got it from school at 11 years old. I'm a drug addict. I'm eating zannies and smoking weed and stealing a car and drinking, man. It started to break my heart that there's kids out there that are 11, 12 years old like I was. It's already getting high and trying to find out where they fit in life. And there's churches all around this valley that are empty, that don't have no children in them, man. But they're not going out to reach the children because there's no anguish. There's no burden. They're comfortable. They're comfortable where they are. It breaks my heart, man. We don't have anybody that's sitting down to cry. I remember being a teen challenge and we'd have altar calls for three, three and a half hours. I'm talking not even a pastor saying anything other than just weeping and there being music playing. But you had a group of people that were anguished over the condition of their lives and anguished over the condition that they didn't have the Holy Ghost in their life yet because they didn't believe and they were anguished over it. God, I want all you have for me. Yeah. And I watch God take absolute failures in life, inmates and drug addicts. I've been in federal prisons and preached the gospel. I've been in county jails and preached the gospel. And I've seen people in all of them begin to get saved and weep their way to Calvary, man, because somebody felt anguished enough to do something about it. Amen. The unqualified, I'm not qualified for this. I was at that men's rally and I'm looking out among that, that, that audience and looking at the stage and I remember being in different places that I spoke where there was a lot of different people and I thought, God, I'm probably the least qualified here. But I don't know anybody else that just anguished over the condition of people that I am, man. I don't know anybody that just sits and weeps over the thought of it, man. Somebody going to hell, man. It breaks my heart. What breaks you? What breaks your heart? What anguishes you? What gets you to the point where you feel like you need to sit down and weep over the condition of something that's going on? Man, how many of y'all have lost loved ones? You need to be anguished. Anguished over the fact
fact that if they took their last breath right now, we know that heaven's not their home. I can't make them do it, but I can compel them. I can get to where they are and speak it and speak it. And like you do sheep and cattle and try to get them in to the house of God so they can have an encounter, just one encounter that might change their life or plant a seed, man. But so many of us are comfortable in their sinful life because we've seen it for so long. We've lost that anguish over it. And we see him day in and day out. Hey, how's it going, man? What's up, man? You good? Yeah. Okay, have a good weekend? Yeah. We don't have any anguish. And he sat down and he wept, man. Rob, I was telling you before church, there's times I have to pray, God, give me tears. Because I'm calloused and I'm hardened and I'm cynical right now. And I'm being critical and I'm being, I'm being frustrated and I'm easily angered. And God, I need you to let me weep again. Break my heart for what breaks yours, God. And that's my prayer. That's what it has to be. But you can see in verse 4 of Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah says this, When I heard these things, when I heard about the devastation, when I heard about the hopelessness of my people, he says, I sat down and I wept. It crushed me. It broke my heart, man. It anguished me. And what's so interesting to me is think about where Nehemiah was when he heard this news. Right, Nehemiah was a thousand miles was a thousand miles away from his homeland. It wasn't anywhere even close, man. Right, he was over a thousand miles away from his homeland, and he's living this good and comfortable life in the palace. I mean, he's literally got it made. He eats the same food the king eats when the king was watching his 4K TV up in his up in his chambers or whatever he was doing. He was there with him, and everything the king did, he did, man. Right? And, and I think about it, he was probably just blessed to serve. He was probably blessed to be in the position he was. He's living a completely comfortable life. I don't know about you, but sometimes in my comfort, I can be scrolling across some news story on my phone or looking across some prayer request that someone says to me, man, and I think, oh, that's too bad. It sucks to be them. I guess I'm the only one, right? Y'all ever get there? Sometimes you see, you're like, oh, man, it stinks to be them. I got dealt a bad deal, man. And there's times I don't even get a little bit tore up over it, man. There's times there's no anguish and and, 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 and there's times I think, man, they're a long way away. Sometimes they'll send them pictures of those little kids overseas and you're thinking, you're like, man, that's that's four thousand miles. That's, that's three days away. I don't even know where that's at. I, I, I slept in that part of social studies or something. I didn't even know that was a country. But they send you these pictures and I don't even get tore up over it. I'm talking about me now. I'm not putting that on you. I don't get tore up over the fact that they don't have a meal to eat. And all my kids, even though we got a slew of them, man, they ate and then they ate again. Then they had a snack. And now they're eating a snack while they're supposed to be in bed when they're not supposed to be. And they're drinking Kool-Aid and pop. And they're spoiled rotten, man. And you see this little kid that, that is the same age. And they're, they're emaciated. And their ribs are sticking out. And their bellies are swelled up. And we're like, oh, man, that stinks to be over there. We're living comfortable lives, man. We have everything we need. we got a chapel and a roof over our heads, man. Over there they're having church out in fields, man, with, with no electricity and they're storming. People are walking 10 hours to go to church because they're so desperate for a touch from the Lord for their family and for their loved ones. They'll walk 10 hours to church. They don't even have Bibles. So they go and they have a place called Prayer Mountain over in Kenya, man. They go up there and they pray for hours because they're like, we don't have a Bible. We don't know what it says. And there's not enough ministers over here. So the only thing we know to do is pray 24 hours a day and hear the, hear the heart of God. And that's what they do, man. They're so uncomfortable, it's unreal. But we get so comfortable in our little settings. And then if the music's a little bit too loud or, or if the preacher went a little bit too long or he didn't preach long enough, man, and we're, we're so comfortable that we've missed the ability to be anguished over the condition of people, man. Because we're living a comfortable life. And you might see me, I'll say a little prayer for them and then we go on. And But 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 I'm trying to just let, let a story into my heart. I'm trying to get us to slow down like Nehemiah did, man. And Nehemiah had a choice. He could have acknowledged the trouble of his people and said, man, that's a shame. I used to be so good friends with so many of them. And that stinks. I used to be tight with them. I, I, I know they're in exile right now, and it's not good for them, but, man, I'm right here next to the king. What am I supposed to do about it? How can I do anything? I don't have the king's riches. I just live in his castle, man. But he could have said, that's too bad. What a shame. I hate to hear that. I feel bad for them. My life's okay. Or he could, let, he could choose to let the pain in. I want you to hear that. He could choose 
to let the pain in. Part of being a good Christian, a good minister, somebody that loves Jesus, man, is to let the pain of others in so that you can feel what they're feeling. God with me, when I'm in the altar and I'm doing altar calls, the Lord will literally let me feel what someone's feeling. I'll feel that pain in the lower left side of my back or, or I'll feel that pain in my foot and I'll call it out. And every time I've called it out, someone's responded so far, 100% of the time, man. And God, God uses that. I, I let the pain in. I feel it. There's, there's been times on stage I literally had a, a suicidal spirit so strong I couldn't do anything but fall on my knees and weep in front of a whole hundreds of people. And I finally got to the place where I could call it out. I said, someone in here is battling with depression so bad. And right now, even on the way to church, you thought about suicide. And I remember that lady jumped up from the back of the church and ran up front for prayer. And with that hands on her, and we prayed. And she said, God set me free from that. And she's still claiming to be free. And still in church, man. Why? Because I made a decision to allow the pain in, man. And not to be like, oh, that's stupid. I'm not going to say that. And there's people that are critical and they're like, man, you're just guessing. You're saying whatever. And people, that could cause me to be like, you know what, I'm not going to say anything. Because what are they going to think? Or well, I could be broken over the fact that God's a healer. How many of y'all know God's a healer? And the Word of God says that He's a healer. So if He's a healer and you need healing and I'm not anguished over the fact that you're not healed, man, I should be broken over that. Anguished over that because I know that God's a healer. But too many times we're just like that. That something bad happened to them. We just go on with life, man. But what are you broken over? What are you willing to sit down and cry over? What are you willing to let into your heart, man, that bothers you and becomes a divine burden, an ache in your soul, man? When he heard the news, he didn't do what's easy to do and brush it off. But he sat down, he broke down, and he started to cry. I would ask you this question right here, man. What breaks your heart? I want you to think about it for a minute. What breaks your heart? Maybe it's nothing. Maybe your answer is nothing. I don't know what it is, man. But it's something we need to begin to ask the Lord about. God, what breaks our heart? And I would ask you this, man, to pray this prayer, God. Break my heart for what breaks yours. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Does God hate seeing the orphan and the widow out left on their own? What should we do about it? Am I anguished over it? Or am I at the point where I'm like, I'm more comfortable without it? Am I anguished over it, man? Am I anguished over the fact that all across America, there's people that are homeless, a lot of them by choice. I've tried to help a lot of them. And a lot of them say, I'd rather stay out here and get high. I say, well, then that's your choice. But there's a lot of them that don't know any different and have never been led a different way and their family was that way and their family was that way. And they don't know a different life, man. And we got to be anguished over the condition of them being where they are, man. What breaks your heart? I don't expect you to have the same burden as me. I don't expect you to have a national, a national outlook and, and want to help this nation see revival. That's what breaks my heart more than anything in the world is seeing a nation that's going to hell, man. And I want to see a revival. That's the burden that I have. That's the anguish that I've let in. That's the pain that I've let in, man. But what is it that burdens you? What is it that absolutely destroys you when you think about it, man? What is it that creates this righteous anger on behalf of God in you? You know, Jesus sat down and he made a whip more than once. Made a whip. He's not, he's not in a good state. He's, he's not in a happy state of mind when he's making a whip. Right? You're, you're about to go drive people out of the church and flip tables over. And this church is full of people and money and animals and all this different stuff. And I don't see in the Bible either time where anybody challenged them. All right, that means he was men in business in there. If I ran into somebody's business and flipped the table, I'm probably going to have to fight him. Right? I didn't see anybody challenge this man. He was serious. He was in there with this righteous anger. What gets you to that place, man? What gets you there? This isn't, this isn't right. What makes you say, not on my watch? You've heard me say that countless times about the number of people dying. Man, that's happening on our watch. On our time as a believer, as a Christian, there's more and more and more that are dying. And we have the answer. And that burdens me that I've been... That's why when you see seen Alicia talking about singing this song and watching this video of all these people praising God in prison, she's been there. It breaks her heart to know that they're there, but they can be set free and they can be chained because it happened to her. So it anguishes her, man. 
It brings her to tears. What is it that crushes your spirit when you look at some injustice, perhaps, to a group of people who are in need in this world, man, and you say, why doesn't somebody do something about this, man? Maybe for you it's troubled youth, man. Maybe, maybe it's people that are held hostage to drugs. Maybe it's special needs children, man. I don't know, maybe it's kids that have been bullied and neglected and, and your heart goes out to them and you're anguished over the condition of what they've experienced, man. Maybe it's those bound by addiction and your heart breaks over it, man. And you realize you've got to do something about it. You see that they're a hostage to drugs and they're trapped in this lustful world of pornography. And they do anything to get free and you do anything to help them get set free. Maybe it's homelessness. I know people that have homeless ministry and they do it constantly, man. And they're out there and they're helping these people that take advantage of them and have nothing to offer them ever. And yet they do it faithfully because it anguishes them to know that our God's provided this home for me and he can provide it for them and he can give them a new start and he can give them fresh direction, man. I'm anguished over the people that don't know their identity in church. I'm broken over it, man, because if you don't know who you are, you don't know what to do and you go through life aimlessly, man. I'm broken over that. Maybe it's people who have been trafficked and abused. And your heart breaks over the fact that this young girl, man, had no, had no control over this. And she feels like damaged goods and a failure. And you know that she's anything but that, man, because it wasn't her fault. Maybe it's, man, you see people sleeping overseas and they just need a mosquito net. I don't know what it is, man. Maybe you're like some people and I know you have a heart to get God's word into the native language of every single person living today, man. Maybe, you, maybe you're anguished over the fact that most of the places overseas don't have one of these. You're blessed. I got 15, 20 of these laying around. Man, I, I got them everywhere. In, in every building, in every vehicle that I have. I got them in my bedroom. I got them downstairs. I got them in, in the downtown office in this place. I got some upstairs in the classroom. They don't have these amongst millions of people. don't have one. Maybe that's your anguish. Maybe that's your burden. Just say, you know what? For $2 a Bible, I'm going to send millions of Bibles over. I'm going to get people to give $2 and $2 and $2. And this nation is going to send millions of Bibles over so they can have the same privileges that we have. Maybe that anguishes you that they don't have Bibles, man. Maybe you feel called to speak on behalf of, of the unborn. And we just seen some victory in that area, man, in our, in our nation, man. And I praise God for that. Because that's the prayers of people that were anguished that wouldn't let up that just that refused to just get comfortable like you know what it just is what it is they're just going to do what they're going to do and we'll just sit down and let them do it i hate it it's not good and, and it bothers me but what are you going to do about it instead of that people decided to pray and stand up for something man and they saw these innocent children begin to see worth and value in them and they spoke about it and, 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 and it's going and, and god's making changes man Maybe you're like some people I know, and, and that's your heart, man. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe it breaks your heart. And what is it that burdens your soul? God loves people right where they are. And he invites them, man. Whosoever is thirsty, come in to the presence of God. So what breaks your heart? What, what right now would bring you almost to tears if you think about it? Maybe you're saying, I don't feel burdened like that for anything. Then you need to get on your knees before the Lord and you just say, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Move me, God, to the point of tears so that I can be effective in what I'm doing, man. I worry when it's been a long time when that hasn't happened to me. I do, I worry. I worry when it's been a while and I haven't been able to get emotional over something or it's not breaking my heart anymore to see somebody give up and walk out and go back out into a life of addiction and a life of chaos. And I'm just like, let them go. It's whatever. Because I've been there, man. And I know when I'm there, man, I, I worry. Because I'm, I'm in a place where I'm not good. I want my heart to be tender. I want my heart to be broken by the things that break the heart of God. What do you do when you can't take it anymore? You sit down and cry. The second thing you do, and just hang with me. I got 37 things I'm going to talk about tonight that we're going to do. <laughs> just kidding. I only got three, man. Second thing you do after you after you sit down and cry is you kneel down to pray, right? You kneel down to pray. Nehemiah says this: For some days I mourned and I fasted. We've forgotten how to fast today in the church. I'll just be so many people, man, fast 
and pray. You want to see God move? Fast and pray. You want to see a breakthrough? Fast and pray. You want to see God move your heart and give you a burden? Fast and pray. You want to see God put somebody in your life that you need? Fast and pray. You want to know if that's the one or not? Fast and pray. Man, you want your wife to be transformed in your kids and your, your community? Fast and pray, man. So Nehemiah, for many days, it said, mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. Listen to me. If it's big enough to cry about, if it's big enough to complain about, it's big enough to pray about, right? I know a lot of people that come to me and they'll be like, Josh, this and the community and the chief and, and Rob Smith, that sheriff, you don't understand. And, and they come and say this and your wife did this and she sang too long here. And man, it just gets to the point where I'm like, holy smokes, have you prayed about any of this? Well, no. Get out of my face then. That's what I want to say. Have you prayed about it, man? The biggest church in the world doesn't have counselors. How? I meet with 90 people per week sometimes, man. There have been times where it's been that crazy. How do they not have counselors? He said, because we teach our people to pray. There's over 100,000 people in this church. They pray. When they have an issue, we say, go up to the prayer mountain and pray for a day. And when they come back after a day and they say, I don't feel any different. They say, go up there and pray for three days. And then if they come back and they say, there's nothing different, go up there and fast and pray for a week. And so we come back to the church and leaders of the church say, go up there for 10 days to a month, fast and pray. Do whatever you have to do until you have an answer from the Lord. Get anguished over it. Too many people would just get uncomfortable in their situation and they want somebody to complain to. They want somebody to, to just be an emotional dumping ground for them. And they just blah, 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 and just put all this emotional garbage out. They don't feel no better. They're not healed. They're just for the moment able to get through it. But when you sit down and you fast and you pray, man, you begin to petition the God of heaven to move on your behalf. And if your heart's breaking for what God's heart is breaking for, then you're going to pray according to God's will. And the will is going to be done as you pray. Because if you pray according to God's will, what is that? answer yes if you pray according to God's will what does he promise us the answer will be if we pray the affirmative it's going to happen you're going to see the prayer answer man can you imagine uh, sometimes man people just say the most insulting things man like all we can do now is pray <laughs> all we can do now is pray can you imagine how insulting that is to God. Man, all we've tried everything, all we can do now is pray. People say that all the time. It blows my mind. Can you imagine God in heaven sitting on his throne saying, oh, well, man, all you can do now is pray. I have the answers. I have all authority. I have the kingdom, man. I mean, it's down to me now. Uh, you should be, uh, all you can do now is pray. But unfortunately, that's how we are, man. All you got is me, the all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God that knows your future, that's forgiven you of your past, man. But, but, but man, we forget about that, man. And he said that, that he fasted and he prayed, man. Man, you're screwed now. I can hear God saying, you're done now, man. You know, all you got to do is pray, man. God plus one is always the majority. Y'all hear that, man. God plus one is always the majority. You might feel like you're alone. You might feel like the only one standing against what you're standing against. And I do at times, man, because more people walk away, I feel like, from me than ever come around, man. But it, I, I, I can't shake the burden to continue to do what we're doing in the way that we're doing it because I'm, I'm, I'm burdened, I'm grieved, I'm anguished over the condition of so many people that don't have the answer when we have the answer right here, man. And Nehemiah cried out to God in verse 5. He says, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and who keep his commands. He said, God, let your ear be attentive, right? And your eyes be open to the prayer of your servant that is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. He said, I'm praying, God, to you day and night. I'm not stopping, man. Let your ear be open and your eyes see me, man. But I'm praying for the servants of you, God, for these people, the captives, man, the one whose home was destroyed. I'm anguished over them, God. You watch Nehemiah's prayer and you read on, man. He confesses his own sin in prayer. Y'all with me? I don't see a lot of confession going on. We get into the presence of God and listen to this. 
Man, Isaiah gets into the presence of God and says, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. You know why that's such a powerful statement? Because that was his strength. He was his oratory skills, his ability to put into words what God was speaking to people. That was his best strength that he had. Then when he got in the presence of God, he said, my best is unclean in your presence, God. And he confessed his sin. And God, God had an angel and he took tongs and took a hot coal and touched that hot coal to his lips. And it burned it and it represented the grace of God, man. Your lips are now cleansed. They're purified. What you feel like is unclean, I'm going to make clean. That's what God did, man. And so many times, this is where we need to be. When we get in the presence of God, too many times, man, I don't see people that are repenting. Like we're just, we must be living perfect lives. A lot of times I feel guilty when I'm up here and, and I'm praising God and I'm coming down here and I'm laying in an altar and I'm like, I'm the preacher. How come I'm the one laying in the altar? Does nobody else have issues? Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I got too many problems and nobody else does. Maybe it's not reality to think what, what maybe I'm just really screwed up, man. But he got in the presence of God and immediately he confessed his sin. What did Nehemiah do wrong? Nothing according to the story. But he just knew that he had to get right with God. If there's nothing else to pray about in that moment, the first thing you can pray about is, God, purify me, cleanse me, touch my mind and my heart. I need an encounter with you, God. It's almost non-existent today, man. People take altars out of their churches, man. They take them out of there and they don't even have altar calls anymore. And give time for people to fast and to pray and get down before the Lord, man, and, and make a decision, man. But 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 Nehemiah prayed and, and he said, man, I confess my own sin, not the sins of my people. And he reminded God of his promises and of his faithfulness. How do you pray and see answer prayer? Call God on what he said. Pray, remind him of what he said. God, no, you said I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what you said, God. And I'm holding you to that because right now I don't feel like I can make it and I can get through it. But God, I'm praying that prayer. God said in Romans 5 to call those things that are not as though they were. What's that mean, man? That means if you come and you have a sickness or a disease or, or you have a stronghold, the Bible says pray and call those things that are not as though they were, man. Right? I'm going to call this thing that is not. It's not healed, but I'm going to call it healed in Jesus' name because I'm anguished over the condition of this person that God can heal. And if we would just get on our faces and get anguished over it, we would pray and God could touch it, man. Lord convicted me earlier today. Alicia's eye has been, since her eye surgery, it's been twitching. It's been like giving her spasms and stuff like that. But earlier today, she said something about it. And immediately, God quickened my spirit and said, Man, your wife's been telling you about this, and you haven't even stopped to pray for her. And I, I, I prayed for her that moment, man. We were in line at the, at the, at the hot dog shop, man, but... But I just got right next to her and I just prayed under my breath for her eye to stop moving. But I thought, God, why wasn't I anguished over that? My wife's coming to me and God's a healer and you say you're a healer. Why didn't I think first thing to do is lay hands and pray on this eye and get it to stop twitching and being uncomfortable? God, you're a healer. You want to do that work? And I'm like, I just is what it is. I got pain too in my ankle and my ankle. It goes spasm and we got those mirror neurons. And every time you have something, I have something. You get mad, I get mad. You get happy, I get happy. You know, people like that, man, I don't feel good. Oh, me neither, man. My belly's hurting too. And it's like, no, it's not. It's mirror neurons. You ever, you ever yawn and then watch everybody in the room yawn? It's true. It's called mirror neurons, man. It's a real thing. We have them, man. But, man, sometimes we lose the ability to be anguished over that. But after he, he mourned and he fasted and he prayed, he went before the king and he asked permission. He said, king, I want to go. I, I honor you, King, and, and I'm right here, and I told you I'm always going to be with you, and, and, and would you grant me permission to leave where I am to go back to my people and try to rebuild? Well, this 50,000 people have already tried this, man. You, 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 you're, going down to, uh, you're going down the creek without a paddle. There's nothing that's happening here. You're not going to be able to do anything. But, but, he, but he cried. He was anguished and he prayed and he fasted. And then he knew what he had to do. He went before the king. And the king said, I'll grant you the favor and the presence of man. And I'll give you what you need to get the trees out of the, out of the forest so you can rebuild the gates. And then I'll give you everything you need, man. And I hope you understand that what you pray about really really reflects what you believe about God. I want you to hear that. 
How you pray believes what you believe about God. Are you praying that, 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 that man, that, that your family, that every one of them would be on fire? Are you praying that they'd be filled with the Holy Ghost? Are you praying that this nation would be transformed by the power of the gospel? Are you praying for our kids to be transformed, man? Because what you pray for, that reflects what you really believe about God. I can listen to your prayers and know what your faith is, man. Because some people pray, God, I'm so... And they can't get out of that beat down, beat up mentality. God's forgiven you. And if you've asked him to forgive you and to set you free, he does. And he has. Now he's given you the authority to shake all of hell, man, with your prayers. So I hope you understand, man, that what you pray about really reflects what you believe about God, man. If only our prayers are, 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 are bless this food and keep me safe. You know what's going to happen? You're going to have less food and you're going to have safe travel from point A to point B. And that's going to be about the extent of your Christian life, man. But, but, but if you pray, God, give me a good day. You really don't believe that the real powerful God, but when you ask God to stretch you, and when you ask God to use you, and you when you ask God to get you out of your comfort zone, and when you pray for the impossible, man, God moves. He does miracles. He brings healing. Look at my life, man. This is an example of prayer. I had 32 years in prison over my head, and I was going to throw the judge for it, and I'd already been locked up in three states, and only different facilities, man. I was a failure. The definition of it. Dope fiend, drug addict, drug dealer. Healer, that was all of the above, man. And you got to the place where my family finally started to get up in front of a church and say, we got a kid and we need prayer. We need Bible-believing Christians to pray because our son's going to die. We, this is literally life or death. I remember dying, waking up in stairwells, and the only the only thing the people that were with me did was empty my pockets, and I woke up with a random man giving me CPR, and my pockets are empty. Everything I had in there is gone, left for dead, man. These are the people that I was around, intentionally putting myself around. But this prayer, man, and, and this ability for people to be anguished over the condition of their son and over the condition of their friend's son, man. And all of a sudden, this powerful God began to stretch me and he began to save me and reach his hand down to me. He did a miracle. He brought me up out of a hospital bed where I wasn't going to walk again, man. I laid in the living room for like a year, man. Laid in this living room in my mom and dad's house. And I couldn't sit up past 20 degrees because of the car wreck that I was in. I couldn't get dressed by myself. I couldn't wash my own hair. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, for a time, I couldn't do anything, man. I would have to get on this electric wheelchair that laid back and I, I'd wheel down to the garage and lay on one of those lounge chairs like at the pools so I could get the hose and rinse myself off and get a bath. I couldn't do anything on my own, man. But they began to pray. And they begin to pray. And I remember my pap speaking in tongues, man, and praying and laying hands on me and dancing in my living room. Me thinking, this is the weirdest man that ever walked the face of the earth. And he said, Josh, you know right now that God's a healer, that I believe that he can heal you. And if you believe that, you get out of this bed right now and walk. And I'm like, sure, pap, I believe that. And I'm thinking, you nutcase, man. You're not. But he believed it, man. He was anguished over the condition of his grandson. He said, Josh, I pray that I've asked the Lord not to take me until I see every one of my grandkids saved. Everyone else was saved but me, man, at this point. And I finally gave my heart to the Lord. And he got to see me preach one time at a church. He took his necklace off. And it was his preaching necklace. He took that off. He got his preaching shirt on. He took that off. He had his preaching belt. He took that off. Alicia wears it all the time, man. It's got a great big belt up on it. It says Jesus. has a Holy Ghost dove and a rainbow on it, man. And, and that was Pappy took all his preaching and stuff off. It was like here. It was like he was passing the torch. Here you go, grandson. And shortly after that, he passed away, man. But it's so amazing how he was anguished over the condition of his family. And look what happened. Every one of us, even the dope fiends and, and the drug dealers, got saved, man, because of the ability for him to be anguished, to weep, and to pray, man. What's so interesting to me about Nehemiah is this, man. Actually, this is the first of 12 prayers that he prayed in the book of Nehemiah. That's 12 that we know about, man. That means that he would have prayed hundreds, maybe thousands. This was just the first of 12. And we see at the beginning of the story, and we see it all throughout the middle, and the last thing he's doing is praying. He goes before God. 
What I love about him is that you're going to see in the upcoming weeks, when, when, when you read, he is a leadership genius, man, right? Nehemiah is practical in every way. He studies, he strategizes, he casts vision for the people, he delegates, he's a leadership genius, and yet everything he does is faith with immediate faith-filled prayer before his good God, before he does anything. He prays about it, man. How do you begin the good work when you can't take it anymore? And you let it into your heart and you sit down and you weep over it. You get anguished over it, man. Then at some point you kneel down and you pray and, and then once your heart's been broken and you've sought the goodness of God, the third thing that you do is you stand up and you act. Right? What do you do, man? You sit down to cry, you kneel down to pray, and you stand up to act. Nehemiah takes the cup and goes to visit the king, man. And his heart is heavy, and the king can tell him. So in verse 4, the king says, Nehemiah, what is it that you want? All right? Then watch him again. Here's a, little, here's a little prayer. Here it comes. Then I pray to the God of heaven. He prays again, and then he answered the king. He even prayed before he spoke in response. All right? I answered the king, if it pleases you, if your servant has found favor in your sight. Let, let, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried. Why? So I can rebuild the wall. He said, my people are hurting, right? The walls are down. We're going through these trials. The city is exposed, man. And I cannot sit around and do nothing. I just can't. I can't sit around and do nothing. Somebody has to do something about this. It might as well be me. And he stood up to act. Somebody needs to do something. And I want you to hear me. It's going to be us. Because the longer we wait for somebody else to do something, the more we're going to sit and see the numbers rise and see the diagnosis is given of mental health disease and all this different stuff. It's going to be us or else it's not going to happen. Why do I say that? Because I've sat and I've looked and I've prayed and I've reached out and I've partnered and I've done all these things, man. But, man, what's going to happen is going to be us if the burden is here. I don't know who this is going to talk to, but there's somebody, there's something bothering you. You're dealing with something right now and it's bothering you. Maybe you've tried to keep it at a distance and, and, and right now and you need to start to be able to let it in, to let that burden in, let it overwhelm you, let it absolutely overwhelm you and you're going to sit down to ache and to cry about it, man. Every single ministry that I've ever been a part of has been birthed. <clears throat> From sitting in tears, weeping over the needs of something that I see, and then praying about it, and saying, God, I'm broken over the fact that these kids in schools don't have anything. I was broken over the schools one day. I mean, we need to get into the schools. These kids need to hear the gospel. This is where I found drugs. I had someone come up to me and they said, are you trying to get into schools? And I was like, well, I'm not trying to. I'm praying about it. But I'm believing that God's going to get us there. And they said, you'll never get into East Liverpool school. Never. I've tried for 20 years. It's impossible to get in there. I said, okay. It didn't change the way I was anguished over the children. It didn't change how I prayed. It didn't change anything. And Rob, I just continued to be anguished over the fact that more and more kids were calling for help. More and more kids were, were overdosing. More and more kids were attempting suicide. I'm going to funerals of 10-year-olds that overdosed and died, man. All this stuff is happening, dude. And it's breaking me. And one day I get a phone call from somebody that's from Columbus. And I go to East Liverpool schools. And I remember Chief was there. And I sat in some meeting and talked to people. And a Columbus person was there. And, and I remember watching God open up that door so I could go in and do a biblical faith-based assembly in a public school, man. And God opened up that door. And I never had to ask. I never had to put it out there to anybody. I never even had to go say, hey, can I speak in your school? I simply was burdened over the children that were there. And I prayed and I took it to the Lord. And God opened up a door. He used a man to drop that bombs about every other word to help get the job done, man. Right? It was amazing what God did. But when you're praying and you stand up to act, man, you go into your prayer closet and, and into your prayer place and you kneel down and you invoke the power of God from heaven. And then at some point, God's going to promise you and you're going to have the faith to stand up and act. There's people in here that I've, I've spoke this over in the last 
In the last eight months, man, that we're going to find somebody that was broken. I think two weeks ago I talked about this. That there was people who had been praying for a partner and they've been anguished over the condition of certain things and we're going to watch it happen, man. And I've watched God do it with certain individuals. They're, some of them aren't here tonight, man, but I've watched God begin to do it, man. It's amazing. God's going to promise you something. You're going to have the faith to stand up and to act. But who am I? You say, but who am I? I'm not the pastor. I'm not trained. Who am I to do anything? I don't have a lot of experience in this, man. Listen to me. I want you to hear it, and I want you to feel it. You don't have to be appointed by man if you're called by God. You don't have to be appointed by man if you're called by God. When I stood up here, and I got my ordination, and I got ordained as an evangelist, and I got ordained as a minister, and, and some other things as well, and when I stood up here, it wasn't me receiving that, that calling in that moment. I received the calling long before, and I was already walking in it. This was just the public acknowledgement of what God had already said was going to be done, man. You don't need a place in anywhere to be able to do it. You don't have to be appointed by man if you're called by God. Amen. You don't have to be chosen by people. If God prompts your heart, if He stirs your spirit, if He gives you a burden, you step into it. You step into it. You don't fight it. You don't question it. You don't wait for that leader to come to you, man. I've made all those mistakes. You trust God and you watch Him act, man. You feel the presence of God stirring you. It breaks your heart. I'm trying right now tonight, man, not to weep because studying for this and, and getting ready to preach it, man, I think about so many things that I'm anguished over, man, and it absolutely does break my heart, man. Feel the presence of God stirring you. Everyone in here right now, just close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. I, I want you to, to just take a minute with me, and, and I want you to feel, man, feel, feel. Feel what God is saying to you right now. Feel how God is stirring you. I want you to embrace it. I want you to hear what He's calling you to, man. I want you to hear the voice of God this evening saying, Man, I have much for you to do. You've not done too much. You've not been too wicked, man. It's not too late to turn it around. God still has a big plan for you. And He wants to use you in a mighty way. But the first thing you have to do is you have to feel that anguish over the condition of something, man. What breaks your heart? Jesus, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. God, I just pray right now that, that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours, God. Maybe it'll be something that we never thought we would be involved in, God. I never thought that I would be in, in any kind of government, Congress area, preaching the Word of God, Lord. But you, you've repeated, repeatedly put me there, God. And I thank you that you've given me a burden for our leaders. And I thank you that you gave me an anguish over the, oh, over the condition of them to make sure they're healthy and in a place to lead well. God, I'm anguished over the condition of people that are lonely in the kingdom of God because, man, you've given us a family of believers. You've given us people. And there's so many out there that are, that are living life lonely. Well, God, I believe that they'll turn to you, God. You're going to give them a family, Lord. You're going to put them around those who, who love them and their heart breaks for the same thing. And all of a sudden, those ones that are lonely feel like they're a part of something greater than they've ever been a part of, God. And they start to find their place with you. And you begin to answer prayers. And you begin to use them in a way that they never thought possible. 